I recently watched this clip of a guy and a child riding tandem on a surfboard and the kid is like seven or eight years old and they're in the ocean in wetsuits and the day is like perfect, sunny and the shore is alive. And I mean, really, really alive. Volunteers, families, onlookers are everywhere and people are cheering and the kid is smiling. Kid is zoned in, proud and stoked to be where he was at that very moment on that surfboard, balancing and successfully riding a wave in. At one point, the kid looks back to the shore to someone on the beach and this person could have been like a volunteer or family member and the kid gives like a gesture saying do you see me do you see what i'm doing and this kid is so excited when the kid reaches the shore he's just so stoked and sharing this moment with those around him and this day this event that moment was meticulously planned in order to bring this child and many other children of various needs and their loved ones a break from life life can be really complicated for anyone but when you're a kid adapting to something notably difficult, life can be a bit more challenging. This also goes for the caregivers of this child. Everyone here can use some empowerment, a day of relaxation, and a place to feel the love of the community. This is what a walk on water does. And today we talk with Sean Swentek, the co-founder and executive director of A Walk on Water. So tune in. Through that tragedy, it taught me life is finite. You really have a short window to like take what it is that from life that you want and enjoy it. If you can go back to that day, February 18, 1990, and change what happened, my, my honest answer is I, I wouldn't change it. You're just going to have to go through it, and your strength is going to be found in simply going through it and being authentic and real in the process. I was talking with my buddy, the care doctor today, and she, she turned around to me and she looked at me and she was like, do you think that you'll eventually be beat this? And I was sort of like, yeah, that's probably what I'm trying to do. No, nothing will ever take away the pain of my daughter not being here. It's my reality. Well, I know what my body's going to do to me. I've got a wheelchair in my future. But you know what I've been looking for? What's that? One with off-road the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Just remembering me as I am, happy and energetic and full of life no matter what. You can expect a life kick you in the teeth, but you always get back up, no matter what, and you just keep going. Living Adaptive with Scott Davidson, a podcast about learning to live adaptively. Hey, what's up, everyone? I am with Sean Swentek, the executive director and co-founder of the surf therapy organization, A Walk on Water. A Walk on Water is a really successful nonprofit focused on providing a transformative and therapeutic experience using the ocean, some surfboards, devoted volunteers, and some really rad kids of which have various needs. Sean Swentek is involved in a number of other nonprofit organizations and currently is also a board member of the International Surf Therapy Organization. We're going to talk all things surf therapy and nonprofits. What's up, Sean Swentek? Thanks for coming on, man. You got it. Thanks for having me, Scott. Sean, I missed you guys in July of this year at Huntington Beach. I saw your schedule. I missed you guys. It was right before the Open. Uh, competition that was happening down by the pier, I think, somewhere around that time. And I miss you guys. I saw the schedule. I'm kind of bummed, and I want to catch up with you guys. Are you often down at Huntington Beach? You know, we've been going to uh, Huntington Beach area for the last four years now, but mm -hmm. generally at the uh, Bolsa Chica State Beach area by the reserve. This was our first year in 2018 when we went down to, you know, the actual Huntington Beach Pier area. Yeah. Uh, like you said, it was the week before the U.S. Open of Surf, which was, kind of a, a really a, a big get for us um, being able to sort of tie ourselves into that contest and the, and the foot traffic and everything that comes with that. So we were, we were pretty stoked on that. We were able to open a lot of eyes to, uh, to what we do and to what surf therapy is all about. So that was really exciting for us. And to answer your question, yes, we plan to be back in that same area around that same time period uh, this next year. Nice. Yeah. My kids, I took my kids down there to just hang out at the beach. We're in California quite a bit. And um, that open competition was really rad. We haven't seen something like that. We're from the East Coast and on the East Coast, it's very minimal. There's nothing there's like uh, compared to what you have. Tell you what, don't don't get too down on the East Coast because it, it's funny, you know, as a walk on water has grown and, you know, we're a West Coast based organization, but we expanded to the East Coast uh, four years ago through Montauk, New York. And now we've been down to New Jersey and Virginia Beach, and we plan on a few other locations being added over the next few years. What, what I've really encountered is because there isn't as much access to amazing surf every day of the year, uh, like there is on the West Coast, East Coast uh, surf community is, is almost, they really out, uh, they, they kind of beat the West Coast as far as passion and, 
and love and, and sort of, you know, just that, that feeling that, that, that love of surf in the ocean and, and being by the beach, because to them, it's so much more valuable because they get fewer days per year where they can get in the water and, and get great surf. So, uh, that's one of the things that I've really loved as I've gotten to know a lot of the people and the breaks on the East coast is just the, the commitment and the passion and, and what they love about surf therapy and a walk on water. And, and, you know, we just, we get the greatest reception at the beaches and on these coasts. So it's been really nice. I want to just kind of introduce you to the listeners, just based on a quote of who you are that you've had from another interview. And I think it kind of sticks out to me. Well, it really stuck out to me because it's a cool philosophy, but to get into why you do what you do, uh, you said once everything in life comes down to people and relationships. If you put the people first, Live humbly, listen more than you talk, and genuinely care about the health and happiness of those around you. Success will always find you. How did you snag that philosophy, man? How did you develop that? It's <laughs> a good find, right? Oh, that's a good one. I, yeah, no, I actually, as you started to say that, I was remembering where that was from. Um, you know, I, it, I don't know where I got that from or that mentality from. I think I've just been blessed to have been in circumstances throughout my life where I I had either my parents or I had mentors or teachers or people guiding me who were just, they were the right kind of people and they recognized the importance of um, developing relationships and, and having, you know, a heart and putting people before yourself. I think that was, you know, the earliest lesson I learned. I grew up in a, a pretty religious home. My dad was an ordained minister. Um, and so there was a big focus on, you know, even if, even though we had very little growing up, it was it was still you know you put the other person ahead of yourself. You make sure the other person has all the opportunities in the world before you you worry about yourself. So I've always tried to live that way. And to be honest, I've had as I've gotten older, I've had to sort of tilt the the pendulum the other way a little bit just to make sure that you know now that I have a wife and a baby and a family that I'm taking care of my home before I'm you know out there trying to save everyone else's life. Um, but for me, it's still it's my guiding light. It's it's how I live my life. I I want to make sure that um, everyone out there has the same opportunities or at least something similar to you know what I am blessed with in my life. So um, I'm particularly inclined to help those who um, have maybe a disability or special need or something that precludes them even greater from um, you know having access to some of the things that uh, someone like I have access to. All right, so you have this philosophy. You're really, you're really altruistic from the start. I've seen interviews with you, and it's not just you; it's your organization too. You're one of the co-founders of a walk on water, and this started roughly about six years ago, so or so. But you've been involved in nonprofits since 1999, man. That's a lot of years back. You're not old. <laughs> you started young, man. You started so freaking young. What got you going yeah, at 1999? Because when I, in 99, I wasn't like the, I was kind of just self-centered. I feel like. I, you know what? And and I was too, I, I would definitely say that. And I would, I'm really grateful to the nonprofit world for, you know, helping me find balance in my life. You know, I always say <laughs> I, I have a lot more volunteering to do to, to sort of even out the karma balance. But, um, you know, I was really fortunate. Like I said, I've had people in my life that have come in my life at the right time. And when I was 19 and, 1999 or yeah, I think I was almost 20. And, um, my boss at the time, I worked at a restaurant. He said, Hey, you know, I volunteered for the last couple of years for special Olympics. Uh, they have their winter games up in big bear resort here in Southern California. You should really come volunteer. You know, he kind of sold me on the idea. That's pretty fun. You know, you go up there for a couple of days, you volunteer you, at night, you hang out with all the other volunteers. It's a good time. I said, sure. I'll try that out. Uh, just fell in love with it. It was an amazing adventure. I got to meet these athletes who just were absolutely incredible to me how they, um, you know, overcame adversity and always, you know, the thing that I noticed the most and it is kind of prevalent at all uh, special Olympics events is this idea of happiness and smiling. And all these athletes were just smiling and laughing and having the greatest time, even though they could barely, you know, ski or snowboard or whatever it was. And they didn't care. They were just enjoying the camaraderie of, of hanging out with their peers, of playing a sport. You know, there's this huge importance of sports in our lives. Um, and I just fell in love. So I did, I went back every year for that. A uh, couple of years in, they decided to add snowboarding to the programming um, as snowboarding was really gaining in popularity around, you know, the 2000s. Mm -hmm. uh, and nobody else snowboarded that, of all the volunteers in our group that went up. It was everyone was a skier besides me. So they asked me to help them create this program, help them set up courses, develop the programming and, and sort of manage it. And so I did that for a number of years until I think 2007 when uh, the winter games were unfortunately defunded uh, in Southern California, just due to the cost. But 
Uh, I continue to volunteer at Special Olympics over the years as I can, usually with the summer games, uh, volleyball or golf or some of the other sports that I play. Um, they're an amazing organization. I take a lot from my time there, and I continue to, to speak quite often with some of the leaders there um, just to pick their brains on, as a walk on water grows because the way that Special Olympics did it is, is really beautiful. They, you know, they're a national, international organization, but they have, a, uh, they have these branches that focus on these really small areas. And so in that way, it feels like a small local nonprofit that's, you know, actually supported by a huge overarching uh, group, which I think is a smart way to do it if you're going to grow to that size. Um, But yeah, so that was uh, almost 20 years ago. Um, In the early 2000s, I was introduced to surf therapy through uh, another charity called Surfers Healing, which is one of the original um, nonprofits that does surf therapy, you know, founded by Izzy Paskowitz and uh, I found myself falling in love all over again. And, and for something that was completely, I don't want to say completely different, but a completely different experience, at least in my eyes for the athletes, uh, the special Olympics, you know, I'd been doing it for many years at that point. I, I would see all the same athletes every year. They were pretty consistent and they were pretty consistent in their performance. They weren't really, you know, changing or their personalities or their, they weren't really growing. They were just experiencing this, but there was something about when I saw kids go in, the ocean and go surf and the way they came out versus how they went in was this incredible transformation. Um, and so there was something there that was more than just the activity. It was, it was something that around the actual, you know, surfing or maybe being in the ocean or the waves crashing or whatever it might be that was really creating an experience that was something that I'd never seen before. So really fell in love with that and was super excited to continue to volunteer over the years with that. And through that, uh, I met Pat Nataro who, was just, you know, the founder of a walk on water had this, this crazy idea to, to, you know, take what was going on with surfers healing and, and a lot of other organizations that were doing that and, and turn it into, you know, what it's become here today. And so i um, super blessed to have been a part of that and, and to continue to grow in this industry and, and meet so many amazing people. I mean, there are new, new surf therapy organizations popping up every day. It seems like and it's, the sector is growing so rapidly and, and it's a really good thing because there's an incredible need. Um, there, you know, if a walk on water served almost a thousand kids last year, but there's millions of kids in the U S alone that could benefit from, you know, what we do. So there's just, there's so much need and there's not enough, uh, access yet. So a walk on water is kind of the prime example of a surf, surf therapy that is on a very grand scale. Like you said, it's in terms of numbers, volume, you're bringing in a tremendous amount of surfers about a thousand last year. Like you said, I think the goal is to hit 2000 by 2020. You're probably easily going to hit that, um, in terms of, you know, between then and now and, and that timeframe, um, you, you encounter, that means you encounter so many stories, seriously, so many stories. And at some point there's like a story that sticks out, a person that sticks out that really changes you. Do you have something that sticks out in your head right now of a story, something that, that I don't know, fundamentally shifted you? Yeah. I mean, and you know, people have maybe heard my interviews or others with the walk water before. will probably uh, know the story already, but I don't think you can tell it too many times. You know, mm-hmm. we always talk about our athlete, Jacob, who's been with us since the beginning. He, um, he's an incredible young man uh, with autism. Um, his family have, have been, you know, huge supporters of walk water from day one. They, uh, when they brought Jacob to the beach that first day, um, you know, they, they said, we have some friends who've done this. We really want him to experience it. He was very resistant to going in the water to the point that it was very difficult. You know, I remember trying to get his wetsuit on him and he's punching and hitting and, you know, he, he as some kids with autism do, he's prone to sort of violent outbursts and finally able to get a wetsuit on him. And, you know, we're trying to talk him into surfing. He keeps running away. And his parents were like, come on, we really want him to do this. I said, you know, well, listen, if you want, we can kind of just make this happen. And they said, yeah, just do it. So I just picked him up and bear hugged him. And he's punching me in the head. And I walk him to the ocean. I kind of put him face down on the board, hold him down. And our head surf instructor, Stephen Littman, kind of climbs on top of his legs to hold him down and just paddles him out, kicking and screaming the whole way, you know, just exhausting and brutal. And his mm-hmm. parents are in tears. And then he, you know, you just, you look out there and Steven paddles him to the outside and they just kind of sit out there beyond the break. And, you know, you can see him trying to get him to calm down. Eventually, you know, Jacob kind of spins around on the board. So he's sitting on the board facing Steven and they start, you know, kind of splashing water on each other, kind of playing. He's calming down and they do that for, you know, 20, 30 minutes. Steven's really good at 
at creating a relationship with the, with the child and, and getting them to trust them. And eventually you saw them paddle in and they caught a couple waves. And, you know, by this time I was like, all right, they're okay. I'm going to go do some other things. And 20 minutes later, I see them coming up on the beach. So I, I run down and the family was down there and Stephen kind of exhaustedly is walking up the beach. You can tell it was emotionally and physically draining for him. And, and, you know, we all kind of go over and Jacob's got this huge smile on his face and it's just jumping up and down and is thrilled. And, you know, you can tell he really enjoyed it. He wants to go again. It was amazing. And the parents are kind of crying happy tears at this point. And, and you know, Stephen's just kind of talking about the experience and how he relaxed, you know, eventually after he got him to trust him and understand that it was a safe space and that the water was fun and all this. And Stephen was like, yeah, he's like the craziest part was after a couple of waves, I felt him really relax and he kind of turned to me and, and started saying things like, you know, water and ocean surf. And Stephen was like, it was incredible. You could tell it was really, he had felt what it was that surfing was. And his parents were like, well, what are you talking about? You know, he's a four year old boy, but he's never spoken in his life. He he's nonverbal. Stephen's like, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. You know, when we were out there surfing, he started talking to me. Um, uh, and it still makes my skin kind of bubble, but um, everyone really started rough. crying again. And, and uh, it's Jacob's been surfing with us, you know, multiple times a year, every year since then for the last six and a half years. And if you saw him at the beach today, he'd come right up to you and shake your hand and have a conversation with you. And a very well adjusted young, you know, 10, 11 year old boy. No um, way. That's really rad, man. It's, it's incredible, man. It's, uh, it's truly life changing. I, I, I can't tell you the number of testimonials we have from parents that, you know, they say, this is, we've never, we've done every treatment there is, and this is the first time they respond in this way. And we, we hear about kids who for the next couple of days or weeks or even months perform exponentially better in school. They have better relationships with their friends and their peers. They, you know, they don't have these periods of lashing out there. It's just, it's incredible how there's this peace and calm and, and transformation that comes from surf therapy. You really have, um, it's not just limited to say autism. It's a walk on water is pretty expansive. You involve the siblings, the family. It's a pretty expansive group, but then you add in also, you've worked with kids that are coming from other situations, you know, socioeconomic backgrounds that are difficult or um, it, it, children with cancer. There's a bunch of areas that you guys hit. Have you found though lately, um, there seems to be a need to, there's been a lot of you know, trauma soldiers are coming back. For instance, this is just an example, but like, do you, do you find yourself serving the PTSD, uh, arena or other arenas, um, in the mental health realm? Uh, certainly we have, and you know, our mantra to walk on water when we started was, you know, we want to reach any and every child in need, whatever that might be. You know, uh, certainly we have a lot of children with autism just because it's so prevalent. Sure. Um, but, you know, like you said, we've had kids of, of every different special needs or disability. And then what we did see was we started to get some some inquiries from adults and, and specifically those in suffering from PTS. And um, we we said, well, you know, our mantra was always say yes to everyone. So we said, sure, we'll take we'll take you out surfing if you like. Um, for us, it, it's happened a few times. And, the, you know, it's not something that is our focus and it, our events aren't set up probably the best for an, an adult male suffering from PTS or adult female, whatever it might be. Um, ours are very kid centric and kind of fun and, and, and laughable. So, you know, what we, what I like to do generally now, if we get an inquiry like that is invite them out certainly, but, um, through, you know, I, something we can talk about later is the international surf therapy organization that I sit on the board of and help form uh, last year. Um, through that relationship, I'm now, uh, you know, aware of all these other, uh, surf therapy nonprofits and some of which are experts in serving, uh, active or, or, you know, uh, retired military veterans, um, like the Jimmy Miller Memorial Foundation. They're the preeminent one in, in Southern California for sure. And they, they, they work with, uh, you know, a thousand a year when we're talking to, and if you go to one of their events, it, the tenor of the event is so different from a walk in the water event. It's, it's a mix of serious and laughter. And cause it, for these guys, a lot of it's life and death, you know, some of them are telling stories about how they were ready to kill themselves that day. And then they went surfing and it changed their life. So it's a lot different from a child of special needs who really needs to be surrounded with joy and love. These guys sometimes uh, have some really tough stories, but, but still, it's an incredible thing for them. It really is, and and you're right. There's, it's it's been shown to be absolutely massively beneficial for those suffering from PTS. 
you have such a good model. It's almost like you can implement. I know it's the the atmosphere is different. I got to watch a few videos, and again, I'm super not happy with myself missing out on you guys in July because that would have been a perfect time. To, but I I did get to see we'll what see it's like. Year. Yeah, for sure. And I got to see you guys. Um, it seems like there's a lot of cheering, a lot of enthusiasm. There's just a good environment there. But you have something called surf therapist. To be a surf therapist actually requires you know some tra- some training to get out there in this realm um is not easy i don't think people get that it's not very easy what what goes into becoming like a surf therapist yeah yeah and you make uh, you bring up a great point there's for us it it was incredibly important to us from day 1 to have you know best in class surf instructors what we call surf therapists um there's a few things we're fighting as a, as a surfing organization. There's a stigma around surfing for a lot of people who aren't in the industry or aren't surfers. They view everyone as sort of a Spicoli from fast times kind of thing. And <laughs> they're like, Oh, oh sure. I'm just going to hand my kid to some strangers, uh, probably stone is going to go take them out, you know, and push them yeah. into giant waves. And, um, and so we're, we we're, we're always fighting that. And so for us, we wanted to really convey the professionalism with which our surf therapists, uh, take this. These guys are all lifelong surfers. Many of them ex pros. They are. They have thousands of hours of experience doing what we do, which is tandem surfing on these bigger boards, which is a, a whole different ballgame. You can be an ex- exceptional surfer and an ex- exceptional shortboarder and have a lot of trouble on these big tandem boards. Yeah, I can't imagine. So we're looking. You know, we bring in these guys who have experience doing this and understand how to ride a big board with you know counterbalancing the weight of this uh, this athlete with special needs many times who cannot control their own body weight and are flopping around, you know, so there's, it, there's a ton that goes into that. And then we take everyone through our training courses that we've designed in house with a lot of input from the other organizations as well that we've worked with. Um, but for us, the number one fo- uh, focus is always safety. Everything we do has an eye on safety and making sure that we run the safest possible event. So these guys are, you know, all CPR certified. They all, we last year took them all through something called big wave risk assessment training uh, with this group of uh, professional big wave surfers out of Hawaii led by Danilo Custo. Um, And so we learned how to, you know, in adverse conditions, if something happens in the water, how to do water CPR, how to do water rescues. We really go above and beyond to make sure that we are absolutely prepared for anything that could possibly happen. And so you know, you mentioned the sort of the tenor of our events and how you see a lot of clapping and laughing and, and that, you know, there's a lot that goes into that from our events are not just the the child and the surf therapist surfing the water. There are layers and layers of volunteers supporting that, uh, you know, all with an eye on safety, but also with the mindset of making sure the child has the best possible time. And so if you're talking, you know, just uh, safety wise, you know, in the water, we also have a full team of water safety personnel in the red jerseys who are either lifeguards or trained swimmers who are, who can get to the child within three seconds if they fall. Uh, we have the blue jerseys along the shoreline, the beach safety, who are catching the kids on the boards as they come in and keeping everyone safe on the beach. And then you have all the different beach volunteers. And so if you go back to the beginning when a family arrives at the beach, the moment they park their car in the lot, we have someone in the lot greeting them with a big smile and welcoming them to the event, helping to carry their belongings or push their child in a wheelchair or whatever it might be. Um, you know, all the way through registration and the wetsuit station and uh, the athlete chaperones who, who, you know, hold the child's hand the whole time until they're in the water. We have these layers and layers of volunteer support that enable us to have the safest possible event while at the same time making these families feel like, you know, it's all about them and it, because it really is. Um, That's free. The walk on water surf therapy. <laughs> Our events are not just, you know, the athlete. It's it's an experience for the entire family, a way for them to have a day off from the difficulty and drama of raising a child with special needs. So we take care of everything. We give them breakfast and lunch and healthy snacks and drinks. And there's a yoga station. There's a massage station for the parents. There's uh, live music. There's an art station. There's games and crafts and and just all these different things rolled into one. And that's why it's this big all day seven hour, eight hour experience for the family where at the end of the day, the kids are hopefully exhausted and asleep in the back seat on the ride home. And the parents have a moment of silence and are going, you know, they're just thankful that they had this day to get away. Your attention to details is like second to none when it comes to nonprofit, especially the athletic side, because this is an athletic endeavor too, you know, and you're fighting the ocean. This isn't throwing baseball on a field. You're fighting uh, crazy waves. It takes a ton of organization. And I wonder about you, Sean. You grew up in Santa Cruz, I believe, right? And, and That's correct. How 
just as a kid that was probably a skater probably a surfer part of a scene santa cruz was not tame then how like like what was it like for you growing up were you just always a surfer were you always in no the scene? you know i i it's it's funny so and, and the funny thing about in santa cruz you'd be correct i did actually grow up in a communal living situation so essentially a commune um, cool. but I was very much a, a sheltered child. You know, as I mentioned, my dad being a minister, we grew up in a home, uh, that the church, uh, paid for with all these other, uh, sort of poor indigent, you know, individuals. And I had this very sheltered, quiet life. Uh, we were only there until I was nine years old, but it wasn't like I was in my teens, you know, smoking weed down on the beach or anything. But, uh, I did grow up at the beach. My dad was a beach volleyball player. So I was playing beach volleyball from four years old. Um, and so I was at the beach every day, but I was playing volleyball all day. But I would get in the water and I would body surf and I loved to body surf. So I got really good at that at a young age. I would have loved to have surfed. We couldn't, there's no way we could have ever afforded a surfboard back then. But um, I didn't find surfing until much later in life. So when I was probably about 20 years old and, and was introduced to surfers healing and, and sort of fell in love with it at that point, that's where I was like, okay, I, I need to experience this for myself and understand what surfing is. And that's when I, I started surfing on my own as well. And you know, to this day, I'm a terrible surfer, but uh, I have a passion for what it does and, and how it makes me feel when I go in the water and how I see it, uh, you know, affect those kids that, that we work with. There's some monsters coming out of your area in a good way. You know what I mean? There's some real badasses. Oh, yeah. But you, Christian oh, yeah. Bailey, there seems to be a crew. There's more names coming out of that area where you guys are just very, I don't know, in tune and willing to just give your time and give your efforts. It's it's just, um, uh, you're not the first person I've encountered from that turf that has sort of the similar background in some ways and some, you know, but it, it seems like you guys breed some really damn good people up there. And hearing your well, background, the, though, wow, like the, yeah. the conditions were different for sure. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, there's there's sort of a, a groundswell of change happening in the surf industry and, in, and within surfers as a whole where, yeah, there's still that little bit of that badass, you know, singular mentality, but there's a lot of people realizing that just because surfing is this solo sport doesn't mean there isn't a way to give back there. You know, our one of our board members who's the head of our surf therapy team, Stephen Lippman, is a renowned badass, tough guy from the beaches of Malibu. Um, and he's, you know, you get him on the beach with these kids, he's got, he's a giant teddy bear and he's crying and, you know, he's the sweetest guy in the world. Um, and it's because these guys do want to give back because the sport's given them so much. They want to give back through, uh, through their passion and, and help, you know, people who wouldn't have otherwise had the opportunity, you know, the crazy thing to think about is a lot of these kids that were taken out for surf therapy. Yeah. They've never surfed. A lot of these kids have never even been in the ocean or been to the beach. You know, we have parents drive from four hours inland for the first beach day they've ever had and, and their kids getting in there and catching bombs with some professional instructors. So we're, we basically ramp up the experience of surfing into, a, you know, from having to take months and years to learn how to surf to, you know, in one hour, the first time you're in the ocean, you're pulling into like, you know, an overhead bomb and, and just having the best time of your life. So yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty um, incredible. Yeah. I do feel like your cult, uh, the culture, surf culture is being, uh, or getting a little more relaxed in, in terms of, uh, involvement. You see way more, like you said, there's a lot of organizations that are kind of trying to bottle themselves after what you're doing or Jimmy Miller or other ones, you know, that are, that are involved. And that's, that's great. There's a lot of love out there for sure. Um, but yeah, the culture seems to be starting to show even more and more attention to, to not just, you know, being that badass on the beach. That's, you know, like you said, a solo surf scene, but involving making it a community sport. So that's pretty cool. I want to hit on this though. A walk on water, the knockout hat, man. I got to go here. This is uh, it's sold out. I've wanted this hat for a couple of weeks. You have some badass <laughs> gear. You have some great, I, there's so many organizations I want to support, but their stuff sucks. Yours doesn't like, and I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be mean to the other yeah. organizations, but their stuff sucks and yours doesn't at all. And I want that hat. I, I, I would buy like four of them right now. So, uh, I'm uh I'll, I'll get on the phone with our, our guy after this and see if we can't get some made. Um, you, you know, one of the things for us, uh, <laughs> to at least as far as the merch being out, we try to just make what we need where you yeah, don't want to sit yeah, on yeah. a bunch of inventory. We're really focused everything we do when it comes to using donor dollars is focused on getting the maximum return. So we make the minimum amount of merch that we think we can sell and, and get the maximum return to, to put back so into the charity. Smart. I was the merchandise kidding. was, the, no, no, listen, I hear it a lot. Cause, and I feel bad, but if you come to the event 
everything's available at the event for sale. So that's that's the key. And then what's online is usually what's left over after the event. We've had a partnership since day one with Caton, uh, which is one of the original surf brands, uh, Canvas by Caton, you know, back in the day in Southern California, just huge company. They're amazing people. Their head of sales is one of our head surf instructors. Um, they're just great partners and they, they do beautiful stuff. You know, the design itself mostly comes internally from, you know, Pat and Steven uh, in the early days were doing all the design and, and both of them just have a keen eye for that sort of thing. We're, we're very fortunate to have such a cool looking logo. Um, you know, we hear that from some of the other organizations. They're like, gosh, we're so jealous that you guys have such <laughs> a cool brand. Um, and, and we're fortunate in that. That's that I think that because we had an eye on that as we started, um, that allowed us to to maybe realize some success a little quicker than we would have otherwise. Um, you know, I that's something I always like to touch on is that a walk on water was created on the backs of like a really amazing group of people, all of whom had a lot of success in the business and, and professional worlds in whatever sector they were in. And we had this really great diverse group. So we had people with marketing experience, PR, branding, legal, um, you know, people with production experience, photography experience, videography experience, and having all those voices together in the room allowed us from day one, like you mentioned earlier, to have an insane attention to detail. And so we've always been that way to the point that a lot of partners and vendors we work with are sometimes like, gosh, you guys are exhausting to work with because you won't let us <laughs> produce something that's not perfect. And we're like, yeah, we have to. for us, the brand is part of what we are. And we want people who are part of this brand to have pride in it and know that we're never going to let something less than perfect go out. We're never going to have an event where it's less than safe. We're never going to allow something to happen that doesn't you know, coincide with what we believe is the right way to do things in our mission and our vision. So, and we're, and we're okay to, to sort of die on that hill. Man, die on that hill all day, because I think you guys are the best at that. The merch is awesome. Um, easily something I, anybody could, I don't know. It's just really freaking good. I mean, it's the stuff like, I, as soon as I saw it, I'm like, wow, why isn't everybody just copying your model, calling you guys, please help us. We're not in competition to you at all. Let us know what you did. Cause it's really, it's really good. I mean, I know of other organizations that are huge, vast, huge, and yeah. they don't come close to what you do. And you mentioned that the people in your meeting room, I want to touch on this, the people in your meeting room, the, the, you have so many figures from so many different backgrounds. Your board of directors is unreal. Your board of directors, the, <laughs> the people you're involved with is unreal. It's second to none right now. Seriously. We're, we're definitely super fortunate and, and we continue to, you know, uh, sort of bring in new and emerging talent. Um, I have a couple uh, people on deck that I hope will, will roll into board seats this year that I think will, will really round us out even more. Some additional endemic, you know, core surf industry guys, some people who uh, I have a guy, one or two guys actually that are experts in scaling business, which is really you know, where we're, we find ourselves right now is we're growing really rapidly and, and understanding how to grow responsibly, meaningfully and doing it, you know, the right way. Cause you know, um, one of our board members loves to say that, you know, um, she's brilliant, Laura Rubin. She, she always says growth doesn't always mean bigger. It often means better. And so we, we always have an eye on how can we improve the things that we do? How can we make our events absolutely perfect because to the outside eye yeah they might look perfect but when we critique them afterwards we're like we could have done this better we could have done that better and so we're always trying to improve our processes and to your question honestly we do get a lot of other organizations reaching out and we get a lot of other organizations not reaching out but copying what we do which you know is the sincerest form of flattery as long as it doesn't infringe on our trademark for sure um but you know Honestly, we we believe in the spirit of sharing and giving, and we want other people to succeed because we can't serve everyone. We're not trying to serve everyone. It's impossible. Um, so we know that there needs to be other people out there in other organizations. And that's a big reason that we're from part of the International Surf Therapy Organization, what we call ISTO, um, because we want to see these other organizations succeed. And um, I don't know if you've looked into that at all. And if you want me to speak on that, I, I'm more than happy to yeah, talk for a sure. about yeah, what that hit, is. Touch on that a little bit, because that really brings um, these surf organizations together, it seems like, right? Yeah. So, so International Surf Therapy Organization was founded in October of 2017. It was uh, it was really made possible through the efforts of Waves for Change, who got a, uh, is a South African surf therapy organization that's doing amazing stuff for disadvantaged uh, youth in South Africa and beyond. 
um, they got a grant. They brought together, you know, eight founding organizations from around the globe, you know, everywhere, Australia, Portugal, you know, America, you know, South America. Uh, and we came together and we said, how can we help raise the tide for this entire surf therapy sector? And so we created this idea that there could be this nonprofit at ISTO that supported all the surf therapy nonprofits worldwide, providing resources. So we would all share all these documents and internal information we have you know, freely with these other organizations so that when they're starting out, they're not behind the eight ball. They have the, the access to the ideas and the things that we've already battled through so that they know where the speed bumps are. They know where the hurdles are. Um, and so that has already grown immensely. There's now, uh, I think, 50 contributing organizations just a year and a half later. Uh, and we could, we plan to grow to more. The next ESTO conference will be in November in actually California this time. So that's going to be a huge event. It's going to be kind of a big coming out party for ESTO. Uh, the last two conferences have been sort of internally facing. This will be open to the public. And it's going to be a big event. And it really ties back to what I talked about earlier with the changing of the guard in the surf industry where all these surf therapy nonprofits are like, yeah, we, we're not trying to hoard what we have. We want to share what we have so that we can reach more people and that we can help these other organizations and mentor them so that they can reach more people. So if I start a surf therapy or I'm just kidding, but that you're right. I think people do imitate your trademark. I'm going to get a living adaptive podcast hat with exactly your logo. <laughs> it's a sick logo. Uh, yeah. Man, I can't tell you how many times I see something very similar to our logo. Same here. Instagram I've seen day. it. I've seen it like twice. I think uh, it's, yeah, many will copy. That's it. That brings a good question though um, to you that I thought of while you're talking about the, the organization as a whole and a lot of people will imitate or a lot of people, you know, they're nonprofits, especially nowadays, nonprofits tend to have um, a lot of negativity, nonprofit against nonprofit. It seems like there's a lot of that trying to take the other one out or undercut them. What has kept you folks like a walk on water out of this negativity or at least being able to um, go through it? I, I think, you know, the number one biggest one was that almost all a, a big portion of the, the founding group of walk on water came from surfers healing. So we had that level of respect where we were like, we're coming from another nonprofit starting our own. We have nothing but the utmost respect for surfers healing and, and all that they do and all that we've learned from them. You know, which is why, you know, from day one, we were like, listen, we want to to work with you guys. You know, we're not trying to go against you. You know, we're not even in the, you know, you guys specialize in autism. We're, with, you know, kids with any disability. We, we just want to expand access. And so we've had that mentality since day one. And we've had many, you know, organizations that have either been offshoots of us or that have come to us wanting to form, looking for advice. And we're happy to help those people do that. You know, we've donated surfboards to other organizations that are just starting out. We've, we've done a lot of different things to help those emerging because we, it, it, it's simple math. You know, there's millions of children in the U S suffering uh, from some sort of disability or special needs. And if we're serving a thousand of those kids a year, the, there's the, the math just doesn't check out. Yeah, so, for sure. Listen, I'm happy to help them. And, and, you know, a lot, I think that a lot of the vitriol comes from, you know, the, the lack of funding. Nonprofits are notoriously underfunded. Everyone's fighting for dollars. We don't view the funding that we get as something we need to fight for because most of the funding we have is relationship based. It, it's the, the work that's been going on for many years by all of us that's come to fruition and that we continue to deliver on. So that those relationships stay strong. If another organization was to go to one of those funders, they probably wouldn't have much success because they don't have that existing relationship, nor do they have the proof of concept, the, the deliverables on the assets and the return on investment that um, these other, uh, you know, that these uh, funders have seen from a walk on water. So, you know, we don't have any, I'm not going to say we have no fear of, you know, losing funding. It's certainly, that's always a possibility, mm -hmm. but we are of the mindset that, if we focus on being the best we can be and doing the best we can do and always doing what we do because of our mission, which is to, to serve children with special needs and their siblings, um, we're going to be fine. You know, it's when you start worrying about what the other guys do and you start changing your, your focus and what you do, that's when you get in trouble. Man, I really goes back to um, the quote I read at the 
earlier in the interview is, or at the beginning of the interview, where you talked about if you genuinely care about the health and happiness of those around you, success will always find you. And it does seem Absolutely. to be the case. It really does. Now, you have an, um, the, again, our audience, a lot of folks in our audience are involved in nonprofits or, or they're running nonprofits, especially individuals I interview tend to almost universally have a nonprofit or a nonprofit in the works. I've seen many prevail and many struggle. And it seems like more seem to struggle or fold or just not really, you know, just not even get off the ground. What is some advice you can provide? Maybe just one thing that sticks out to you because there's so much advice I'm sure you can provide, but something that sticks out to you um, when you hear this. Yeah, I mean, and listen, it, it's been a long, hard road for us. I'm not going to say it's <laughs> been like some easy, beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. um, the results are beautiful, but there's been a ton of hard work behind the scenes. And we've had our hiccups and our issues we've dealt with. I think the number one thing is anyone starting fresh needs to know what they're getting into. It's a, it's a tough road. And I think what people sometimes think they can do is make a nonprofit kind of their side hustle. A nonprofit requires multiple people's complete attention um, from the get-go to really, you know, grow in any kind of meaningful way. And we were fortunate in that there was a number of us who really had the time and the bandwidth to pour into this thing from the start um, and then continue that over the years. You know, as the, as the charity grew and when we got to the point where we needed someone to, to really take the take the the helm as this executive director and, and help it to to get some direction it was fortunate that i was in the position that i could take that job because i was fortunate enough that my wife is a doctor and, and just had just started being paid well and you know i could take their big pay cut and do something like this so a lot of things have fallen into place for us in, in a fortunate way you know it, it's if someone's like, oh, I'm going to start this nonprofit because I have 15 hours a week that I can put into it, it's going to be a long road. Um, even when I was working my full-time jobs in the corporate world when we started Walk on Water, I was still putting in 30 hours a week on the charity on the side. And and the only reason I could do that is because my wife was in residency and was working ridiculous hours. So we just didn't see each other and it worked out. Uh, but there were other people, well, you know, Pat was putting in 30 hours a week. Steve was putting, we had all these people that were so committed and so passionate about it. But that was also a bad thing because we all burned ourselves out, you know, two years in. And so everyone had to kind of take a step back and go, all right, take a deep breath. Are we really going to keep going like this? And the only way we could do that was to continue to bring in additional talent. So I think that's another key point is to always keep an eye out for people who can help you in, in the organization. And, um, you know, if, if you can find the right role for the right person early on, that's super key because, We've often had, you know, plenty of hands on deck, but everyone kind of just all over the place and not really doing what's, what they're best at. As soon as you can create a structure where you understand what your needs are in your nonprofit and start to identify the people within your organization or outside the organization that you can bring in that fit that need and want to give back, then you all of a sudden start really making a, a meaningful difference in a real fast manner. It seems like fundraising and partnerships are super important to success. If you don't have both, then finding success is very difficult. No, absolutely. I, I think one of the inter interesting things about A Walk on Water, especially in the first few years, is that we had almost no funding from corporate gifts or from major donors. All our funding was coming from word of mouth from the families that would participate, their uncles or grandpas or whatever would donate 50 or $100. And then our volunteers would kick in $20 and there's parents would donate a hundred dollars. You know what I mean? It was a lot of that. Yeah. And then, you know, but at the same time, what we, all of us on the board and the, and the founding group, we started reaching out to our contacts that we've had for years and years saying, Hey, here's my new passion project. I'd love for you to get involved. And because we had that existing relationship, we were able to leverage that. And so for instance, our big, our first big corporate um, partner was John Paul Mitchell systems, who to this day continues to be our title partner every year. Um, Stephen Littman was a photographer is a professional photographer and he was shooting a Paul Mitchell spot. Um, and he met John Paul DeJoria and he was wearing an AWOW hat. So it goes no back way. to the logo and John Paul's like, and John Paul's like, wow, that logo is really cool. What is that? And he just, he sat down over, you know, John Paul DeJoria is also the owner of Patron. Uh, they sat down over a glass of Patron and he proceeded to tell him the AWOW story. And, and John Paul gave him a check right there for 10 grand to fund an event. And from there, it just, it blossomed. John Paul actually came to that next event that he funded, unbelievably, with his wife and walked along the beach and got in the water and played with the kids and he fell in love. And so that's the other key component is, yeah, it's a relationship, but I mentioned earlier, you have to deliver on 
something that means something to the funder. So yeah, there's nothing, I, I always tell people, there's no greater experience than actually coming out to a walk on water event and seeing it in person and feeling the magic in the air. We can't, we try with videos and things like that, but we can't translate the experience of really being there. So any nonprofit that's experiential based, if you can get your funders involved in a meaningful way through volunteering or just coming and being a VIP at the event, uh, that goes a huge way towards solidifying that relationship and making them uh, not just understand where their money's going, but really be proud, you know, pride, prideful on their investment and, and what they're doing and the impact they're making. Yeah, it's pretty rad to hear, you know, such a, a prominent figure, you know, getting out there, actually hanging out in the water, uh, donating, doing that stuff. Again, it goes down to, well, that logo it goes, it goes back to that logo. That logo is that amazing. That's why your hat's sold out, by the way. It it really is what you guys do. <laughs> is, yeah. True. You guys are really freaking good yeah. at it. Um, it, it, but yeah, it, again, it, and I should stress it, one more time though, your board of directors, you really do have a who's who there. I mean, you have people that are involved in, in the arts, you know, from, uh, from from developing and pretty famous animations, you know, doing stuff like that. I mean, you're all over the spectrum when it comes to different ideas, different creativities. You know, it's just a pretty pretty well rounded, pretty incredible organization. I got to go back to this though. Water. What is so like? Is some I'm a Pittsburgh kid, man. I had a skateboard. I didn't have a surfboard. Mm-hmm. What is so damn therapeutic about the water? In your words. It's, you know, it's cleansing. Um, uh, as a Pittsburgh kid, I'm, I'm sure you still jump in the shower every day. You know, yeah, how after yeah, a, a shower, you, you feel, you feel, you feel better. You know, there's something about being in the water and there's a ton of research going into this. And, uh, you know, I've been digging into this a lot more over the last years as I've gotten to know, um, Wallace J. Nichols, uh, who's part of the blue, who created the blue mind movement, who believes that water, uh, in many different formats is incredibly healing and, and life-changing and he believes in living this blue mind life where you have you know some sort of water space activity every day there's just there's something about it i mean the earth is you know majority water our bodies are majority water water is really the basis of life and so i you know i listen i'm already kind of a hippy dippy kind of guy sure but it's easy for me to get into this idea of like it's a natural substance that is naturally occurring on earth. And when you get into that, it's sort of a return to nature and, and natural state. And it just feels good. And there's something, you know, I, I take cold showers. I, I, Tony Robbins got me on that years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when the ocean is cold and like you jump in and you kind of freeze for a second and then your, your brain kind of starts firing it and you relax a little and all of a sudden it's just this incredible clarity and, and you know, sense of purpose and being and, and place it's really an amazing feeling. So I, I'd love to understand the science better. You know, I'm, I'm no scientist myself, but I try to read a lot of the research that's coming out. And there's a ton of research that continues to go into the sector because people have, you know, the, the anecdotal and qualitative evidence is there. It, people's lives are being changed through the water. Once what we need to figure out is the quantitative data and exactly what is happening, you know, what's causing that change. And there's a lot of speculation. People talk about the, the breaking of ions when a wave crashes. They talk about the oxygenation of the water. They talk about the motion of the the water, you know, the consistency of it, the, the return to the, you know, the womb state. There's lots of things that go into it uh, or theories, if you will. But I, I, I don't know the answer. I just know that it, it feels really good to go surf. Uh, and it seems to just be life-changing for, for people who really need it. Yeah, there's so many that do need it. This world has a lot of good and a lot of pain. And mm-hmm. and while this is, you know, while the pain's going, there's a lot of difference makers out there. And a walk on water is for sure a difference maker. You're a difference maker. Just hearing what you do and how you guys give all the time, it was easy to jump out to you. I feel like um, getting getting more attention to the organization means a lot. You have a huge population base and you serve pretty much anywhere, anybody coming from anywhere, but you do serve a huge population base locally and it makes a dramatic difference in, in the lives of those that you, you know, that you interact with on a daily. And also during these big events, I think it means a ton to them and your models is really impressive. Now you guys often get this question. In fact, I'm so damn impressed when i hear the answer they say how can i volunteer <laughs> how can i volunteer and you guys are like we already have too many volunteers is that still the case <laughs> how exclusive uh, is that i mean 
we certainly have more than we need, but we always need new volunteers, if that makes sense. Um, there's a few things at play here. We're trying to create a pipeline of highly trained, highly, highly qualified volunteers. So that's why we continue to add more training days each year. We're going to have three this next season um, where we really train people on exactly what we do, the exact way we do it, the AWOL way, if you will. Um, and so we need more people who are committed at that level. What happens is we tend to get, uh, you know, a lot of people in a new area that are sort of one off, you know, just want to come out, which is great. But then it, it runs counter to our focus on a really safe, effective event. So, you know, for us, the goal is to have, you know, at least 65, 70 percent of the volunteers at an event ha- already have experience with a walk on water. So that leaves, you know, room for 25 to 35 percent new volunteers. Um those volunteers still, if they're going to be in a position that is involved, you know, interacting with the child or is in the water, need to go through some level of training with us before we'll let them do that. But that doesn't mean they can't come work the registration table or work the parking lot as a greeter or, you know, help the families get set up on the, we have all these different volunteer roles on the beach that allow for first timers to come in. So that's kind of where the log jam is, is those first timers that don't have any experience with us, aren't surfers, just want to come volunteer. We're kind of backed up there. And often what we'll do is we'll, we'll tell those people, listen, we can't necessarily have you come out in official capacity as a volunteer, but we always encourage people to come down to the beach and cheer on the kids from the beach. We love having a big section of people along the shoreline cheering and clapping for the kids as they come in on their board. Um, they really, the kids, it can't be overstated how, how life-changing that is for the kids to see someone celebrating their achievements because it happens so rarely in their lives. Yeah, it is pretty intense. But if you guys had any more, fall, I mean, like how much more can you do? Do you want to stitch a towel for them on a beach? I mean, you guys go so far above and beyond. <laughs> like seriously. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we always are of the mindset of, yeah, what more can we do? That's um, awesome. We take the feedback that we hear and, and we try to get better every day. I don't think that we're, we'll ever reach perfection and we're certainly not there now. So for us, it's it's a constant battle to improve our services um, improve the experience and, and make sure everyone, you know, has the best day they can. You and life rolls on are, um, you guys have this, I don't know. I just point to you two all the time for the organizations to turn to. If they say, what do we do next? Look at them, follow them, do everything they're doing. Je- yeah. Jesse's an amazing dude. Um, he comes out to a lot of our events and, and we try to get to as many of his as we can. And, um, you know, what he's doing for the adaptive community is, is really unbelievable. And his level of organization and safety is very similar to ours. And we love uh, their focus on that and, and how they create a really safe but enjoyable experience for the participants and the volunteers. Now, I want to round out this interview by saying, what's the best way to follow you guys? You know, I'm going to put it in the show notes. And so those driving don't jump over to anything. They'll be in the show notes. But like, um, what's the best way to get in touch with you, to follow you? What What is it? Uh, yeah, I would say start with our Instagram. That's kind of our lead social media channel. So we're just at a walk on water, a W A L K O N W A T E R. Uh, we also have a Facebook page, a Twitter account that we're active on. Um, and then just go to our website. You know, if you're driving, it's easy to remember our, our initials, AWOW, A-W-O-W dot org. That'll kick you to our full website, which is awalkonwater.org. Either one works. Um, from there, you can learn how you can volunteer. You can donate. You can learn more about all our events. You can see the schedule of events. We'll be releasing our 2019 schedule really soon. Um, you can sign up for the newsletters. You can do all sorts of things on the website. So. Well, is it okay for listeners to uh, reach out to you about nonprofits in general, or are you off off limits right now? <laughs> uh, as long as they understand, it might take me a little bit to respond, but I'm always happy to help people as I can. Sean, we really appreciate you coming on today, tell, talking about a walk on water, talking about you, and talking about how to run a successful nonprofit. You guys are the model. What you do is incredible. It really is. And I hope people reach out to you. I hope you get fundraising from listeners that are are listening right now. Go ahead and just drop in. I'll have a link there. Send some dollars towards a walk on water. Let's show some support, show some love to them. Thank you, Sean, for coming on. Thank you so much for having me, Scott. I really appreciate the opportunity. And uh, I hope that uh, we get some new athletes out here because of this this season. So I hope to see you at the Huntington event or any of them, really. Thanks for listening to the Living Adaptive Podcast. 
You can find more information about each guest and the podcast at livingadaptive.com. At livingadaptive.com, you can find previous episodes, links to social media accounts, writings, and a bunch of more good stuff. Peace.